Welcome back. This is part 3 of What if Issei was a half dragon hybrid? I won't drag this intro out any longer. So let's begin. Chapter 5 Issei was in the classroom, waiting for his teacher to finish the class's lecture. Behind him, Septimus was napping on the desk. The male Nekomata didn't care about the teacher or Motohama and Matsuda's dagger like glares sent at him. Issei's friends were mad at his brother because Septimus made his goal-playing pranks on them, especially during their peeping sessions. Today the prankster glued the wall around the holes of girl's locker and stopped Issei before the brown-haired devil could fall into his brother's trap. It ended with both perverts literally stuck to their spots when the angry girls arrived and the trick's author laughing his ass off while playing, Chivalrous Knight. Both guys were also pissed off at Issei and gave him the silent treatment when they've heard about him joining the occult research club and because of Septimus warning his brother before he could fall into Septimus, pranks. When the bell finally announced the end of the lesson, the brown-haired dragon hybrid pushed his brother lightly to wake him. When his brother only gave him a weak stir and a muffled mutter, Issei sighed and smacked the sleeper's head. Wake up, you lazy asshole. Rubbing the smacked spot, Septimus raised his head, swaying some white strands of his eyes and replied quietly in an irate tone. You're not the one who had to heal your arm from some shitty poison. Poison, that if some good-for-nothing fossil that likes to reside in our minds would for once be useful, wouldn't even be a problem. Or if we didn't use the stray devil as a training dummy and took her serious from the start then this wouldn't have had happened. Issei sighed once again, how's your hand, better, but still numb, Septimus replied, flexing his left arm with a displeased face. For the rest of the walk, they were silent, except for some low groans escaping from Septimus. Ten minutes later, they were before the doors to the old school building when Issei stopped. What do you think, should we invite them to meet with Azazel since they know about most things by now? All this is happening on Grimori's territory, so I think that she should have some say in dealing with this. Especially now that we are a part of her peerage. Don't care. Do what you want. The Yukai rudely answered as he walked past his brother and sharply opened the doors. Thinking whether or not warn his king about the leader of the fallen angels and get her to meet him, the pawn of the Grimori followed his brother through the halls. As they entered the clubroom, they were met with the whole peerage doing their things and Rias filling some papers. Hello everyone. Issei waved to the rest of the club. Quote dot dot dot. Um. Septimus barely acknowledged the others and without any other reaction, he walked to his place on the sofa right next to Kaneko. Hanging his head over the backrest he closed his eyes and stopped moving. His behavior earned him a weird look from everyone, not that it had any effect on him. Issei used to his mood swings, just sat opposite his brother. Don't worry about Sep, he's always grumpy when he's tired or angry. Right now, it's both since he's also out of magic. Magic, but I thought that you didn't use any yesterday. Maybe except that running in the air at the end. Actually, what was that? I'm sure he wasn't flying or levitating. Rias raised her head from the documents and fixed her glasses. At the same time, Akino rose from her place and gave Issei a cup of tea. Thanks, Akino senpei The dragon hybrid gladly took a sip. It's really good, he said with a smile to the black-haired beauty and turned to the crimson-haired one. It's a simple trick that Sep came up with, Bucho. He explained to me that when you change the pressure of air in a specific place, it can become solid and therefore can be stepped on. That's not what made him this way though, that would be purging the poison from yesterday's stray. Just let him be and he'll be back to his normal self in a jiffy. Oh, that's good. I want to once again congratulate all of you swift job again since none of you got seriously hurt. The Archduke also wanted to apologize to us for the incomplete information and compliment us for dealing with them. He said that the next time they give us a stray hunt mission, they will make sure to give us accurate details. Rias praised her servants with a proud face, as her queen sat back with a smile after being praised. Kaneko, as usual, 
was eating some sweets with her impassive face and looked between the two brothers. Quote dot dot dot, you two are strong, she just said and took another candy. I have to agree with Kaneko-chan. I'm sure that you will be worthy comrades and part of Grimori clan. Yesterday's hunt clearly showed that you are more than capable to protect our king. Concurred the blonde knight, sending Issei smile that instantly made the dragon hybrid want to punch him. Era era, we have such powerful and cute new members. I just want to play with them a little. Akino joined them and spoke with an alluring voice. She slowly moved closer to Issei, giving him a generous view of her large breasts. As the half-dragon glued his eyes to them with more than a satisfied smile, his brother instantly sat straight at Queen Words and moved closer to the younger girl next to him. Kaneko chan don't let her get me. And for sure don't let her, play, with me. Their reactions made rest of the group laugh, even Kaneko got a small smile. It was like Hyodos brought fresh air to their life as they joined their little family. Akino, stop teasing your juniors. I planned to give you your first contracts yesterday but we were interrupted. So, you both can have the extra contracts. Informed Rias as she smiled contently since her pawn and bishop seemed to fit perfectly in her family. Getting his focus off Akino's body as she slowly moved away, Issei asked. But Bucho, aren't we supposed to be, you know, handing out leaflets first? Ah, that, don't worry about that, with your power level, you can just skip on the handing out process. We'll get you familiars on the next full moon. Rias informed with a wave of her hand. Ah, is that so? Issei then made up his mind. Bucho, I need to tell you something, it's about the fallen in the area. You see, Azazel will be coming to our house to give us the information so we can deal with them. As members of your peerage and since you're the protector of this town, I think you should at least receive an invitation to come to our house to receive the information to and meet the members of the family. Surprised Rias took off her glasses and looked at her pawn. You're saying that the leader of the Grigori himself will come here. Is he going to deal with those Rouge Fallen? Hearing them talking, Akino visibly stiffened, clearly not fond of the idea of Azazel being so close. To be clear, it's not the first time that that old crow came here. Before, back when I lived here, he was freeloading on our dinners quite often came from Septimus, who was again in his previous position. Rubbing her temples, Rias imagined one of the biggest threats to the devils just showing up in her city to eat for free and sighed tiredly. All right, we'll meet with Azazel and your family. So just rest for now and in a few hours, you'll take care of your contracts and then we'll have dinner with the governor general. She said, not believing this situation, as Issei quickly wrote a message to Elaine about more guests coming to their house. DXD, Issei appeared with red flash in a room full of manga, figurines, and others typical otaku accessories. After Rias agreeing to join them on a dinner they just talked about themselves and basically tried to know each other better. When the time finally came for them to go meet their clients, Rias told them the other minor details about forming contract and sent them off wishing them successful contracts. You're not Kaneko chan came from behind him. Turning around, the devil noticed a skinny man in glasses with long hair looking at him with a displeased face. Yes, sorry about that, but Kaneko chan is so popular that she had a few other clients and I'm here in her place. Ha ha ha, yeah, I don't think so. Go away and bring back Kaneko chan the client answered without second to think and tried to push Issei out. I'm sure that we can work something out. What did you want to ask Kaneko-chan? The teen, not wanting to fail his first summoning, twisted out of his way and tried to convince the man to let him stay. He looked at Issei for a moment, then took out girl's school uniform and said something that made Issei's hope instantly drop. I wanted her to wear this. DXD. Uck. I just want to get this done. Of course, I just had to land outside. Fuck my luck, Septimus complained after he got out of the teleportation circle. With a short glance, he walked to the house he landed in front of and knocked loudly. 
Hello. Anyone order a devil here? Sorry. Had little slip with the teleportation. He asked through the open doors. Without thinking, he walked inside. The whole house was silent as he made his way deeper, looking for the person that summoned him here. When he saw light coming out from one of the rooms, he opened the doors and entered. One devil, just as requested. He started but instantly stopped when the smell of blood hit him. Looking around, he saw an abused corpse pinned to the wall in the shape of a reversed cross. Crash. Right after Septimus stepped into the room and spoke, two shots came at him without a sound, one of them embedding itself in a wall behind him. Arg, Motherfucker. He screamed in pain as he dodged first one, but the second hit his right arm. Midair, he aimed his other hand towards where bullets came from and sent there a fireball, but because of the numbness in his arm, he missed the shooter standing in the corner. Depends on whose mothers they are, shitty devil coon. And it looks like your aim just as shitty as your luck today. A young male with white hair walked toward the center of the room his two guns facing Septimus who had his magic circles facing the man, making a Mexican standoff. The man pointing his pistols was in a priest garb and had a deranged smile on his face. How do you like my special bullets? He asked with a melodious voice as if trying to sing. Feeling the light burning in his arm Septimus spat out and cursed anyone who put him in these situations one after another. He turned his shining eyes towards the priest and answered sarcastically. They are as splendid as fuck. Now, who the fuck are you, nutjob? Oh, this devil has a dirty mouth. I, you little scum, am Freed Selzen. An exorcist that loves to kill shits like you, make them suffer and cleanse the world of your existence. Not that it will be much of a use for you when I'll kill you in a moment. The priest introduced himself with an ironic nod. And this poor guy, what has he done, to make you do this to him, sicko? Asked the black-haired teen with a short glance at the body, watching every move of the weird priest and ready to act at the slightest twitch of a muscle. Him, everyone who depends on devils is just as rotten as they are and deserve the same fate. I'm impressed that you didn't even blink, fucktard, but what do you think? Nice greeting, Freed explained with, a sickening smile as he licked barrel of one of his guns. Looking him in the eye, Septimus snorted and smiled a little with pity towards the exorcist. You know, this kind of horror stopped being in fashion years ago. If you really wanted to scare someone coming in here, you should have left some drops of blood on the floor going to the dead guy, face him towards the turn TV which is turned on so I have to come closer to him and turn him where I'd see him killed with something simpler, like a slashed throat or maybe a headshot. But this botchery will only make someone puke. And writing this with blood. I mean, who the fuck puts? Punishment for sinners on the damn wall. What were you thinking, idiot? He ended with a dry laugh. What the fuck do you think? Criticizing my masterpiece here. I'll paint the rest of the room in your blood, you shithead. Selzen roared at him with rage. Septimus eyed the exorcist for a moment and then a sinister smirk crawled on his face. Oh, you're so on, cunt, rat fuck, bitch, horson, twit. Both of them were throwing insults each other, just waiting for the slightest opportunity to kill another. That is until a blonde nun unexpectedly entered the room and drew their attention. Father freed, I, ee she started, but suddenly screamed terrified. What? Both males shouted in unison, turning to the crying girl. They saw her staring at the nailed corpse. Thank you. That's the reaction I wanted to hear. See, I told, this scene is scary, but slut. Screamed with mad grin ecstatic freed. She doesn't count, you degenerate. Just look at her, even simple blood mark would scare this little wimp. Septimus retorted with a sneer. Then he looked again at the girl, scanning her with his eyes. Wait a moment, I know you. You're that clumsy nun Issei talked about. Asia something, with twilight healing, am I right? I I eyes San. Asia stuttered, drawing her eyes from the dead man to Septimus. Oi, you two know each other, dickhead. Cut in freed with a suspicious glare. 
more like a friend of a friend or friend of a brother. My brother helped her and they talked a little. The reincarnated devil answered carelessly. Nothing changed. Your work is a shit and in bad taste, Padre Peterasta. You dickless faggot. He shouted and started shooting at Septimus. Die, die, die. With every sent bullet, Freed repeated this one word. Without time to create a barrier with only one hand, Septimus darted sideways. Running and dodging projectiles, he sent another fireball at the priest, but because of his numb arm, Freed easily sidestepped it. Laughing through his mantra, the crazy priest kept firing bullets, breaking the house further and sending splinters everywhere around. Fuck, Septimus swore and skid a little. All right, playtime is over. The Yukai spoke in a low voice, his eyes becoming orange lights as shadows swirled around him. Let's see how you manage with this, nutbag. Shadows easily stopped the priest's bullets, throwing them harmlessly on the floor. Then, some of it formed an edge, that came with lightning speed at Freed, slashing him over the face. Arg, an inhuman howl came from the exorcist as he dropped one of his guns and covered the place where a moment ago was his eye. But he didn't have time to cry, as right after the first one followed another shadow, blade, that dispersed when he shot it. Septimus just stood amid the darkness, with emotionless eyes looking at the wounded enemy. When his second one was stopped, the shadow mage raised his hand and sent a few others toward the priest. As they neared him, Freed, with the hand that covered his destroyed eye, whipped out something that looked like sword handle. Instantly it shot out a beam of light that cut the shadows. Seeing more of them forming around the devil, Freed did the only thing that could save him. Stop it, he shouted, holding the light sword at Asia's throat when he appeared next to her. With blood flowing out of his ruined face and staining nun's habit, the crazy priest was pointing his gun at the swirling darkness. Drop that weird magic, or this little slut will earn a second breathing hole, monster. Quote dot dot dot, you're lucky that I hate when innocents die around me. Leave her and get out of here, you spineless craven. After a moment of silence, a voice devoid of all emotions came from the shadows, as the blades around the exorcist disappeared. Oh no, she's coming with is my policy. I need her to be sure that shitwad like you won't kill me the moment I turn my back. Freed brought his blade closer to Asia, drawing a small, bleeding line. With tears running down her face, the small nun stared helplessly into the shining orbs. Be it your way, but no one thing, mongrel, if you hurt her, someone really mad will make you suffer. Septimus spoke again in the same voice. The shadows slowly lessened, as emotions finally returned on the teen's face, he looked at small nun with a smile, feeling a weird need to comfort her. Don't worry, if one thing can be said about Issei, is that he is fiercely loyal to his friends. And you are one of them, so just wait for him a little. With that, he summoned Crimson Circle and teleported back to the club. DXD Issei sat back in the club, after informing Rias about results of his first summoning. The client, named Morisawa, turned out to be a great fan of the Dragon Ball series and after short while they ended in a fierce discussion about the best episodes, favorite characters etc. Morisawa almost flipped over when Issei showed him his wings and changed his hands into claws, only for the older man to start to poke his scales and shower him with questions about them. Fortunately, both of them agreed that Issei shouldn't show his fire, but during all of this, both of them forgot to form the contract, which ended with the young devil explaining to his king why he came back empty-handed. I wonder how Septimus, doing on his job, asked Issei to know one in particular. As if those words were some kind of cue, Sedtine appeared in the red circle. When the light died down, Everyone saw Septimus with shadows that cling onto him and a bleeding arm. I'm back, sorry, but no contract here. He dropped, moving towards his spot on the couch. Whole room stared at him as he spoke like everything was normal. What happened to you? They shouted, showed up at the client's house, got shot in the arm, started a cursing auction with a crazy exorcist, met Issei's new friend, 
took priest Sai but had to let him go when he threatened to kill her. Can someone take care of the bullet that got stuck there? I'd do it myself, but it's hard with one stiff hand. He summarized with a bored tone and pointed at the hole in his arm. Issei gave the rest meaningful look and they quickly understood that it was another of Bishop's grumpiness. As Akino tended to his wound, Rius wanted to gain more information, but Septimus was faster. Senpei, I'll explain everything in detail, but please, let me do this at the dinner. It's too long to repeat this to everyone again and again. Then let's go meet Eyes and Sep's family as soon as Akino finishes. Bucho, before we go, I have to warn you. Our family can be called quite extraordinary. Issei thought about some of the possible situations that would happen to the orc in their house and how his siblings would look in front of his peerage. Don't worry, I'm sure that they're wonderful. And so Rias taunted fate. Chapter 6 Don't just stand there and open up. Rias and her peerage stood before the Hyodo residence, with everyone looking at the brown-haired teen hesitating to enter his own house. Issei looked back at them and then slowly opened the doors, sticking his head inside. We're home, he announced, looking around carefully as he walked inside. With every cautious step, the dragon hybrid checked his surrounding, as if expecting some trap or surprise attack. When he made it halfway through the corridor, he didn't know whether to be relieved or worried about the situation. Sorry for the intrusion, said the rest of the group as they entered behind Issei. They, except for Septimus who watched to have between himself and Akino Kaneko's small frame, observed the teen's weird behavior with confusion. Oni-chan, will you stop acting silly? We have guests and you'll weird them out. Izuna appeared from the living room with her hair tied into twin tails and wore a frilly blue dress, cutely scolding her brother. When she spoke, Issei immediately turned to her with his hands raised defensively, ready for her. Attack! that didn't come. Then she turned to the newcomers and waved lightly. Hello, my name is Hyodo Izuna, I'm the younger sister of Sep Nichin and Iz Nichin. But please, call me Izu-chan. Surprised, Issei just stared at his younger sibling, completely expecting one of her. Shows of affection, not this picture of, perfect little sister. He was even more surprised when Rias and Akino rushed at her and squealed something that sounded like, so cute. When both beauties were focused on the younger girl, Issei looked at his brother. Are you sure it's our Izuna? She's too, Issei asked mentally, quote dot dot dot, calm, maybe Ella dropped some drugs to her meal, or Azazel tested his new mind controlling artificial sacred gear on her. You two are terrible brothers. They heard Albion chuckling. Oh, hey Albion, is Red Useless Emperor with you too? You two missed one crazy priest with the dictionary of a sailor. Septimus greeted him as he watched the two girls awing at Izuna's mismatching eyes. Insolent brat, taking Diedrag outburst is. Yes, both brothers focused back on their guests. You must be Grimori Senpei and Himahima Senpei. Eyes Nietzsche and Sep Nietzsche talked about you quite a bit, especially Eyes Nietzsche. Really, please tell me, Izu Chan, what was that they told you about us? Asked the crimson haired devil. Eyes Nietzsche talked mostly about how great your breasts are, whose are better, but eventually couldn't decide, since he already saw and touched your breasts but haven't seen or touched Akino Senpai's. And you must be Kiba Senpei, please take care of me. The girl with silver hair answered in the same tone as before. Oh, is that true, Bucho? You've let our adorable junior touch your breasts. Maybe I should do the same. Akino teased her friend as Yuto and Izuna exchanged pleasantries, making Rias get a small blush. Before the crimson-haired king found the right answer for her queen's jab, Izuna approached Kaneko, who stood there composed as always. Hey, I'm Izuna. The girl started, but then her smile vanished, replaced with bared teeth. What shocked everyone even more, was that the same happened to Kaneko, as she hissed and shaped her hands like cat paws. The two white-haired girls glared at each other with hate in their eyes, killing intent noticeable to everyone there. Ah, 
and what's ironing board doing here? Quote dot dot dot. Talk more and I'll claw your eyeball out. Maybe you'll stop looking like some stupid, half-baked albino after that. Everyone watched dumbstruck as Izuna turned from a cheerful person into a crazy one and attacked Kaneko, who answered with even greater ferocity. It was easy to predict, basing on what? They are. Huh. Both Hyodos were even more confused at Albion's sudden comment. What were you expecting? You know what both of them are. Even if the little cat is suppressing that side of her, instincts are still there. Realization dawned upon both brothers. All right, I'll take Izuna, you calm Kaneko-chan. Getting quick nod from Septimus, Issei dragged his younger sister away, Septimus mirroring his actions with the petite devil. Izu, calm down, you knew that she's Nekomata, so why have you assaulted her like that? Issei quietly asked his sister when they were a safe distance from her new nemesis. Soe, Oni-chan, I forgot, Tihihi. She apologized and lightly hit her head. Seriously. Issei facepalmed at her answer. All right, and what's with you not jumping on either of us at the doors? Hey, really, who do you and Sep Nichen think I am? Izuna jumped up with an angry pout on her face. At the same time, the two Nekomatas stood away, the male one trying to hold the smaller one from lashing at the other girl. Kaneko-chan, before you go and try to kill my sister take a deep breath and let me explain, okay? She inhaled deeply a few times, her emotionless mask replacing the look of rage. Quote dot dot dot, speak. You know, that face is actually scarier than previous, for other reasons. Anyway, the cause of why you're so hostile to Izuna is related to you being Nekomata and your instincts. So please, try not to kill each other. I'll even buy you bonus box of sweets as an apology for forgetting to warn you. Kaneko looked again at the other girl. Quote dot dot dot, what is she then? Septimus grinned widely at that. No hints, you'll have to wait a little longer with everyone else. Quote dot dot dot, all right. After that, Septimus turned back to the rest of the group and gave them a thumbs up meaning that the crisis was averted. Now that no one wants to kill anyone anymore, let's meet the rest of the family and hope that we survive to tell about it. Everyone laughed at his try to lighten the mood. Following Issei, they entered the living room. Inside, they saw two girls watching a tall man in VR headset, swinging his arms and moving left and right. Ha! Take that! Another high score! The man shouted, Everyone, meet Azazel of Grigori! chief of the fallen angels and supervisor of our family project. Issei started an introduction, who apparently tries again to beat me in Beat Saber again. Give up, old timer. Added Septimus with a quick laugh, while Azazel took off the head gadget and turned to them. Not trying, I'm wiping the floor with you, kid. You two were late, so I had to find something to do in the meantime. With that Azazel turned to Rias and her peerage. You must be Sirzex, little sister with the family, nice to meet you. As the person in charge of this area and future head of the Grimori house allow me to greet you, governor. Rias started formally greet him but was quickly stopped. Oh, stop that and just call me Azazel. It's not an official meeting, so let's skip those boring titles. Azazel just waved off her efforts with a smirk. Those outsides of Hyodo family stared at the most powerful fallen angel, completely put off by his laid-back personality. Darting their eyes between him and Septimus, they all thought how similar those two were same hairstyle, tall and completely unpredictable, except the bangs. Without a care about all the attention, Azazel walked to the table and poured himself sake. Anyway, now that we have five out of the six cardinal sins back together, things will start to be interesting again, won't they? Septimus hid his face in hands at Azazel's offhand comment. Please, don't remind me of the stupid name you came up with when we were kids. Six cardinal sins, Rias asked curiously. Azazel pointed at the Hyodo siblings and spoke. I mean them. By the agreement of the three biblical factions, each faction will have to contribute to the making of this project 
Fallen Angels were assigned as its supervisors and the family had to live in devil-controlled territory. The chosen territory was Kuo Town, at that time under the care of Claria Belial, because of her relationship with an exorcist. The angels and the church were allowed to call for their help in any manner that isn't against the other two factions. When they formed their team, I as their sensei, came up with giving them nicknames based on the sins most fitting their character. Don't try to sound cool and wise there, Chuni Crow. When you first wanted to name the team, it was something like, Teenage Squadron of Everlasting Darkness, and every individual member had code name that was even longer. Besides, you could say that there are deadly seven sins, with you perfectly filling the sloth role. Septimus jabbed at him with a playful smirk. So, can any of you guess what our dragon's sin is? Azazel ignored the grinning Nekomata. Lust. They answered without any hesitation. And I'm not ashamed of this. I will become the ultimate harem king. With a harem full of beauties with big opai. Not that small opai are bad, I also love small opai. Shouted Issei with his fist raised and his eyes shining. Yeah, another one is harder. You couldn't say, but Septimus, the representative from the Yukai faction, is our wrath. When he gets serious in a fight he becomes calculative and cold as Kokaitis. And before any of you tries any funny business, Oni-chan is mine. Izuna suddenly stood between her brothers and other girls. Which one this time? Azazel tried to hide his smirk as he poured himself another portion of sake. Both. If Iz Nichen can have a harem, then so can I. She answered, crossing her arms. Please, don't. Weakly pleaded Septimus. Oh, you're jealous. Don't worry, I'll always love you. She beamed and tried to hug him, but he stopped her by putting a hand on her head and holding her at arm's length. No, I just pity all those men that would be tormented by you. Each of them is from a different part of Supernatural, with a different heritage and special powers. You know who those two are and widely what they can. As for Izuna here, codename Greed, she is half werewolf from North Europe. Azazel continued the presentation. After his words, Izuna ceased trying to hug Septimus and turned to the devil's springing silver wolfish ears and tail. Hi, so that's why she and Kaneko chan hate each other. Cats and dogs never get along if they're not raised together. Spoke Kiba as the earlier outburst finally became clear. And don't let this sweet smile deceive you. She's one of the most dangerous sharpshooters in the world. She can fire anything with deadly precision, be it bow, handgun, rifle or cannon, with her sacred gear making her shots more dangerous, even for high-class enemies. After those words, everyone tried to imagine the younger girl that happily waved her tail at them standing against some of the better fighters in a raiding game league. And what her sacred gear is exactly? Asked Akino. Roulette Enchanter, which allows its wielder to give weapons special proprieties, like fire, ice or even holy light. Combined with her skills and her large arsenal in a pocket dimension, it's better to not underestimate her. Right after Azazel explanation, Elaine spoke as she walked up from the couch. Boys, you should let our guests sit down and introduce us too. Oh, right. Cough Bucho. Everyone, meet my sisters, Elaine and Marana. Issei jumped to action, berating himself that he forgot about them. It's good to see everyone so lively and happy, younglings. After everyone introduced themselves, Diedrag's voice came from Septimus, chest, startling again the devils that were not yet accustomed to the way he shows up. Oh heyo, Diedrag Gigi, is Albi and Gigi here too? Izuna cheerfully greeted the old dragon, changing back to her normal shape. I'm right here, wolf pup. Albion spoke Issei's chest. Akiro, a beautiful lady like you shouldn't concern herself with this kind of work. And you shouldn't flirt with my wife, especially when she's friends with yours. My lord, please, we're guests here, behave yourself. Faye, exactly because of that behavior you can't find yourself a boyfriend. Crack, both of you, shut up and set up the dishes. Now, now, stop crying over what this old pervert said and let me help you clean this. 
Hearing a ruckus coming from the kitchen, everyone in the living room listened with curiosity. Shortly after the sound of crashing plates and someone crying, Hyodo Goro alongside a gray-haired man with an eye patch and long beard, came out carrying varying eastern and western dishes. Odin Gigi, both brothers asked as they focused on the second man. You're finally here, Brats. The old man nodded his head as he laid down the dishes on the table. Odin, like the king of the Norse gods Odin, setting the table, muttered Rias, finally feeling like Issei's previous warning when he said that his family was unusual was a serious underestimation. Even compared to her family, this one was just batshit crazy. Good to know that I'm famous, especially among such beautiful young ladies. Answered the one-eyed god scanning the newcomers and taking his time when looking at Akino's and Rias' chests. And for your second question, let me tell you something, devil. Never cross someone making a meal for you or a healer. Especially if said person is both and at the same time one of the strongest magicians this land has. Even gods won't risk something like that. You'd better not. Now stop ogling those girls or the next time I see your wife, she will hear some stories you'd prefer her not to. Hyodo Akiro spoke as she entered the room leading a young woman with silver hair, both of them carrying more bowls of food. I'm Akiro, nice to meet all and thank you for helping my sons. Come, let's eat, you'd better listen to her. My wife's cooking is to die for and if you don't hurry, there won't be any left. Guro laughed wholeheartedly and sat at the table, the rest of the crowd following quickly behind him. Itadakimasu, what brings the head of Norse pantheon here? Diedrag's voice sounded from Septimus. Chesta said teen was busy with hunting for samples of every dish on the table. Officially I'm here to check on the project with my bodyguard Rossweiss here. Odin answered while pointing at the Valkyrie whose eyes were shining at all food before her. And officially I'm here to speak with my favorite brats, eat some of their mother's cooking and visit a striptease club in the human world. Odin Sama. The Valkyrie tried to scold her boss, only to be laughed at by him and the old dragon. It's not like I have something against my body working as a speaker for spirits, but maybe let's go back to the topic and let Zaz tell the Grimoires about the last two. Grunted Septimus while he was guiding chopsticks towards his mouth. Right. Elaine, she's half human and half devil, the devil's representative and the second smartest person in this room, right behind me of course. Young as she is, She's also one of leading minds in mixing technology and magic together, a genius hacker. Her sacred gear is a subspecies of static veins. The sacred gear allows its wielder to control electricity, but her subspecies also giving her technomancy and control over any electricity-based machines. Her sin, gluttony, be it food or knowledge. As Azazel presented the blonde girl, everyone compared their plates to her which was triple the size of anyone else, excluding Kanikos, Issei's and Septimus. Where does all of this G? Kiba started looking at hybrid slender figure but stopped seeing Issei and Septimus frantically waving their arms in panic, their eyes clearly saying, no. And her stopping with her chopsticks and turning a cold stare towards him. The fallen angel smirked as the young swordsman dodged a particularly deadly landmine. And the last present member of the family, Marana Shatarova Hiodo, a pure-blooded human from the church. Born without any special heritage or sacred gear, it's easy to guess that she is Envy. She is highly skilled in healing magic and has one of my first successful artificial sacred gears named, Infinite Orchestra, which manipulates sound in any way its wielder wants, creating solid sound objects, attacking with sound waves or playing whatever music she wants. Great at the parties. HH hello. Marana meekly waved to them. Until now, she hasn't spoken a word, uncomfortable with all the new people around and tried to hide in her seat. Enough with the talking for now. After dinner, the boys will recall the recent past events and then we will decide what we will do after that, but for now, let the children eat undisturbed. Akiro drew the attention from her daughter and for the next minutes only sounds in the room were that following eating and requests for refills. DXD. On top of all this, 
You've met someone who had pinned corpse to the wall and set up an ambush for you. Then the first thing you do is rant about him doing a poor job with its montage, following with throwing insults at him after being shot. Is that what happened? When brothers finished with their story, Mrs. Hyodo was glaring at Septimus who was squirming awkwardly in his seat. But, he tried to defend himself but stopped when his mother crocked brow at him, feeling the temperature around him dropping drastically. Is, that, what, happened? Quote dot dot dot, hi, Ka San. The teen answered quietly bowing his head. His reaction made rest of the room chuckling at the fast change, with Azazel, Odin and both heavenly dragons laughing shamelessly. That is until Akiro's glare landed on the governor general, earning the same reaction as with her son. And you, why did you even employ someone like that? I may be the leader, but it's not like I personally check everyone in the Grigori. Azazel said in his defense, quickly collecting his bearing. Like everyone who knew her, Azazel was well aware of how dangerous Akiro could be, particularly when her children were involved. That was actually one of the reasons why they were chosen to be the parents by him. A magician couple that tried to have a child for years without any result and were ready to give up when one day he turned up at their doorstep and asked them to be the parents for six kids. That and because he'd go nuts if he'd had to do this, not even starting how those brats would end up. Dear, every one of us will agree that watching you grilling over Azazel is great to watch, but he still has to explain to us what those fallen angels are doing in the city. Guru said, drawing his wife's attention. Unlike her previous targets, he didn't even flinch and just sat with a smile. Yeah, besides, in the fight with the stray devils was something funnier than some sailor talk that Sep won't talk about. You know that he, Issei started off handily, wanting to tell the rest how Septimus slipped during the fight with his, NYA. Porn. Fire. Try me. What stopped him was the mental message from said Nekomata, accompanied by an image of burning magazines and a serious dose of killing intent. Actually, it's nothing, forget it. What Issei wanted to say was that while fighting yesterday was that Septimus got so much into his fight, that his laugh was something along, Yahaha. Bam. Unfortunately for Septimus, while his threat worked on Issei, the same couldn't be said about the brown-haired teen's self-satisfied grandfather. Just after Albion spoke, the male Nekoshu's head and the table met at high speeds. What? Sep Nichen said, NYA. Oni-chan, say, NYA, please. Faster than they could track her, Izuna appeared next to her brother with sparkling eyes, jumping energetically and nudging him. No, he grabbed the albino's head making her yelp. Azazel, just say what you were going to say and let's end this. I seriously need to kill something. Hey, alright, around a week and a half ago. Rainer requested a permission to travel to Japan, something about a potential recruit. I thought that she wanted to use this occasion to meet with you and catch up so I granted her and one more person permission to go. When I came back today, I checked the details after her departure. It seems like two more fallen traveled with her here. On top of that, she took with her one of the sacred gear extractors, not to mention a group of 50 exorcists that followed those other two who took with them a few of our mid-tier dragon slaying equipment. Needless to say that none of those were in my permission. Azazel took out a tablet and calmly listed. Sacred gear extractor, slowly repeated Issei. Suddenly, mental dots connected in his mind. Asia, Rainair wanted her twilight healing. That's what for it is. Stopping his sulking, Septimus thought about what his brother said. Most likely. But that doesn't explain those three other angels when one more was enough. And the exorcists. Besides, I'll be first to say that Rey can be a heartless bitch and stealing a sacred gear from an innocent nun wouldn't be beneath her. But she wouldn't kill her friends, even if she's still mad at me. Right, there's also part with you saying that she's mind controlled. Azazel, can you tell us name of the fallen angel that Rainer took with her? Issei again turned to his old teacher. Mittelt. Good. 
This means that Kala Warner is one of those that tagged along. What do you have on her? Issei asked, clenching his fists with a dark look on his face at the name of his girlfriend that killed him. Chu Wing, known for her sadistic tendencies. After her last mission, which ended in failure, she was put on office duty a few months ago, we've lost contact with her about a week ago. No info about any advanced abilities in controlling minds. She said something about, boss, wanting us dead. Also when Rainer listened to her commands, she wasn't directly controlled by her, even with sealed senses I would feel something like that. Added the dragon hybrid, she's most likely just a tool used to get close to you. Someone from the Grigori must have coordinated this, but for more information, we will have to interrogate them. The fallen angel pointed out seriously. Not her. Issei Tone carried the promise that blue-haired woman would die and no one could change his mind. Great, so we have to keep as many of them alive, except for Issei's ex, with whom he has unfinished business. Easy job, and since it is Rias Senpai's territory, to avoid kick-starting another great war, only her peerage should go there, with Azazel taking care of cleaning this up. What do you think Senpei? Septimus turned towards the crimson-haired devil. Agreed. Now, let's discuss details and move out. DXD. A large magic circle appeared outside the forest around the church that was the base of the rogue group of fallen angels. And remember, unless your life is in danger try to capture them, not kill. And leave the blue-haired one to eyes coon. Rius repeated the orders one last time. Everyone was dressed in their usual uniform, except Issei and Septimus, who were dressed in simple shirts and jeans, the former in red and silver while the latter was in all black, contrasting with his white tail and ear. Come out, you one-eyed prick. After you shot me yesterday, I decided that from now on I'm keeping my detection turned on all the time. Septimus shouted at the darkness. After a moment, no one else than Freed Selzen came out with a black eye patch and his hands up. I don't want to fight. As much as I want to kill you for what you did to my face, I know I'm over my head. Besides, why am I supposed to die for them when they didn't even let me fuck any of them? Before you ask, I left the little bitch alone after she healed me, Zebra. So you're running away, but why would we let someone as disgusting as you live? Akino moved forward, lightning crackling in her hands. Because I have some valuable information. We'll let you go if that information will be useful. Promised Rius. They want to extract the runt's sacred gear. But more importantly, the one controlling the other fallen bitch isn't there, he's running away. If you want to kill him, better hurry up. And the one with blue hair. Where is she? Issei spat out. In the church's basement. Rius mulled over the stray exorcist's words. It was true, that thanks to him they saved some time, especially with the extra info about the runaway fallen angel. The chances that he would know something more than others were slim. Still, she wanted to end this twisted man, but she gave her word and wasn't one to back out from a deal. Get out. We'll kill you next time we see you. Exchanging a short look with Septimus, the one-eyed priest resumed his run, quickly disappearing behind the trees. After that, the black-clad bishop turned to his king. It'll be best if you push forward and send me to find the one that ran, Senpei. Except for Issei, no one here can match me in tracking or hunting, and he has something to settle with that bitch. Alright, be careful, Rius permitted him with a nod and turned to rest of the peerage as he sprinted away. We'll fly to the church. Watch each other back and remember to capture them alive, especially if they're a fallen. She spared a quick glance at her pawn. Except the one with blue hair of course. At her words, four pairs of devil wings and one dragon unfolded and the group rose to the sky. DXD. The flight to the church was quick and surprisingly uneventful, and Issei quickly understood why when they saw their destination. The church's ground was full of people in robes led by a short blonde fallen angel in a gothic lolita dress above them. The teen's mind automatically noted that when the wind moved the frills of her dress, 
Her underwear was clearly visible and as despite her childish appearance, many would call her attractive. Oh ha ho, if it isn't that loverboy Warner killed. So you survived by selling yourself to the devils. Shame that you'll die so soon after. The short girl mocked them with disgust and a cruel grin as she summoned a pink light spear. Stand down, Mittelt. We talked with your governor general and he knows what happens here. None of this is was ordered by him and we agreed to put this down. Demanded Rias, preparing her own magic. Issei watched everything carefully, grinding his teeth at the mention of his killer. When Azazel's title sounded, some of the exorcists muttered between themselves, unsure if what it was true. I don't know how do you know my name, but do you really think I will believe you? It's obvious you're trying to mess with us and then kill us when our guards are down. Bucho. I counted 40 of them. The rest must be either inside or with the one that Sep is looking for because I don't sense anyone else hiding around. Half Dragon reported quietly. I see. Eyes Kun. You go inside and stop the ritual. Kaneko Chan and Yudo Kun clear the path for him. Akino. Cover them while I take care of this blonde crow. And remember, I acknowledge this church is enemy territory so you can use promotion inside. Hi. Shouting with the rest of his comrades, Issei changed his hands and legs, red and white scales quickly covered his limbs, his face also undergoing transformation into his hybrid form. The only difference that this had from the last one was that he had a reptilian tail that was covered in red and white scales. Following behind his fellow rook and knight, the pawn used the distraction that they created and entered the church, leaving the battle to his companions. It was deserted inside and no one was there beside him. Dust laid everywhere, benches desperately needed replacement, the main altar and cross were disfigured almost beyond recognition. As always, fallen angels love to make holy places their home and then strip them from all their holiness. I know Deidre, can you sense where they've hidden the passage? He asked smelling the place and founding fresh familiar scents. It appears that there is something hidden behind this altar, most likely leading to an underground part where we'll find your prey. Good. Issei growled and moved the stone. Sep, how's it on your end? He contacted his brother. Nothing for now, but I'm getting closer. I'll tell you when I find them. Septimus answered. Issei stared into the hole under the altar. Stone steps leading underground, with next to no light that wasn't a problem thanks to him being a devil. Stealing himself and expanding his senses, the dragon descended into the darkness. After a short while, the hybrid reached a big chamber lit by dozens of candles surrounding the big cross-like device. And under it, there were three women, with blue, black and blonde hair. The blue-haired one turned to him and greeted him with a fake smile. Hello, eyes, know your sin, Issei Hyodo. Race. Reincarnated Devil. Previously Human Dragon Hybrid. Sin Designation. Lust. Appearance. Spiky brown hair. Brown eyes. Average build. Height 170 cm in basic form. Parts of the body. Mostly arms and legs covered in red and white scales. Tail. Sharpened teeth. And wings and brown reptilian eyes in hybrid form. Powers and Abilities. Partial Dragonification. Immunity to most kinds poisons and fire. Dragon breath with poisonous. Fire or mixed variations. Heightened sensed and basic strength. High proficiency in hand-to-hand -hand combat and swordsmanship. Fire magic. Tuki. Access to personal pocket dimension. Devil magic. Promotion. Dragon gate light red. Likes. Boobs. His family and friends. Women. Porn. Dragon Ball. Games. Dislikes. Anyone messing with his family. Cocky assholes not respecting women. Arrogant handsome assholes. Dragon Slayers. Short backstory. After meeting Azazel and being adopted by Hyodos, Issei grew up listening to stories about his parents and grandparents. That in rivalry motivated him to train intensively from a young age with the goal to reach and surpass the level of both heavenly dragons. At the age of 13, he entered incomplete transformation to full dragon form, 
what almost ended with his death and because of that Issei sealed his powers until he matures and decided to try normal life away from supernatural. Also, because of Azazel's influence, he is strongly fixated on getting his own harem. Chapter 7, Hello, Eyes. Kala Warner's voice hit Issei like a train. He knew what was waiting for him, that he was going to face the fallen that deceived him, he wouldn't let anyone do it for him. It was his closure, something he needed to do alone if he wanted to get over his death. He knew that all too well, but those two short words broke the dam inside him and flooded him with memories. The meeting when she confessed, would you go out on a date with me? Their walks after school when he treated her taiyaki. Um, I've never had taiyaki that tastes this good. Thanks eyes. Their date, eyes, could I ask you a favor? Everywhere Kara Chan smiling at him in a way that made him weak and could convince him to do anything she asked. Images flashed before his eyes reminding him of a week they spent happily. Would you, die for me, and it made his blood boil in rage. Kara was nothing more than a mirage created by Kalawarner to get closer to him. Every smile was faked and its only purpose was to help her get closer to him and kill him. When he was doing his best for her, she was laughing inside at the poor idiot dancing blindly to her tune. Enough. Control yourself. Diedreg's roar shook Issei out of his stupor. Only then did Issei notice that his whole body was covered in dark red tuki and his claws ripped long marks in a wall beside him. If not for his grandfather, Issei would have slashed in blind rage at the blue net, ripping through the other girls without a care, and tear her apart. You want to save that other fallen and the nun. Then you can't just rush at her like some hot-headed rookie, but have to think before you move. When the only response from Issei was a low growl, Kala Warner decided to rub some salt onto the wounds. Not a word, Mo, you're breaking my heart here. Is it how you act toward your girlfriend? She then looked at her companions. Or maybe you're here for those two. Raining his anger down, Issei checked the other two. Asia was chained to a cross next to Kala Warner, with only a plain white tunic on her, crying. Above her stood Rainer in short black dress, guarding the nun. Asia, Rainer, I'm going to, Issei started, but was interrupted. Save them, I don't think so. Rainer follows my every word and will protect me with her life. Also, before you came here, I ordered her to either kill herself or the nun if I died or if she was going to be incapacitated. So, are you ready to sacrifice others for your revenge? Kala Warner spoke, looking down on him as if she already won. What do you want? Issei asked coldly. I'll tell you how we'll do this. You'll be good little dragon and stay where you or when I and Rainer will get out of here. If you will behave, as a consolidation prize I'll leave you little nun. You deserve something for rushing to help so bravely after all. Kala Warner derisively smiled and lightly patted said blonde's cheek. Her smile grew even more and she gripped the smaller girl's face. But try to fight and I'll order Rainer to kill you. You will easily beat her of course, probably even manage to stop her from killing herself. Yet I don't think you can do that and at the same time save poor Asia. Biwahaha. Don't let her provoke you. Rage is a good fuel, but it needs to be controlled. Listen to him, young one. You have to stay focused. When the two dragons spoke to him, Issei looked at the controlled fallen. Feeling sorry for his old friend, he turned his eyes to his new friend. When his gaze met Asia, he saw trust and innocence written on her face despite her situation and knew what he had to do. The pawn of the Grimori closed his eyes, bowing his head and dispersing the dark red aura around him. Seeing this, Kala Warner smiled triumphantly and released the nun's face. Good boy, we'll be on our way and... No, Issei cut her off. Even forgetting about his revenge, there was no way he could leave one of his friends behind. He would not sacrifice an innocent girl either, so the only option for him was to find a third way. Kala Warner would send Rainer at him, but as long as she was on the offensive she wouldn't hurt Asia to use her as the last line of defense. 
that would leave him defending himself from both the Fallens, attacks without many options to lash back and result in a deadly stalemate which none of them could break without consequences. Rainair won't leave with you and the only one who will die here is you. He shouted looking defiantly at her, his aura exploding around him with roaring flames over it. Sep, how is your hunt for the last fallen angel? Of course, everything changed if a third party could remove one piece. If he could prolong this stalemate till Septimus got to the one controlling Rainair and break the spell, that would give him an opening to catch the blue net off guard. I'm close, hang on. During their short exchange, Warner backed off slightly at the sheer power emanating from the brown-haired devil. Regaining composure she scowled in rage and she projected a yellow light spear. Rainair, kill him, she screamed and threw the spear at him. Seeing the incoming projectile, Issei sent a wave of fire at the incoming weapon, vaporizing it. He blocked two more magenta ones, courtesy of the approaching Rainair. The half-dragon smashed another pair with his claws clad in Tuki and immediately dodged the stab of another. When the black-haired fallen kept close summoning multiple spears to be shattered a second later, Warner created another one for herself. She grabbed helpless Asia and destroyed the chains binding her with a short swing. You think you can win here? You can't save them both of them, and if you won't hit back, one of us will kill you. Then, when you'll be lying in the pool of your blood before me again, I'll slip blonde girl's throat right in front of you. And this time, I'll make sure you won't come back. The blue net roared as she grew her wings. Knocking out Asia in her arms, she summoned another spear and flew behind Issei throwing it. Having to protect himself from both sides while holding back was taxing for the dragon hybrid. One mistake could cost a friend's life after all. After destroying another magenta spears, he quickly jumped off the way of a gold one. Not losing momentum, he skidded and deeply inhaled, to breath torrents of fire between himself and his enemies. Using the few short, precious seconds of peace to plan his next moves of how to not to be overwhelmed, Issei prepared himself to buy as much time as needed. If he synchronizes it perfectly with his brother, his plan would work flawlessly, but for now, all he could do was wait and led Warner in a false sense of control. DXD, I'm close, hang on. Septimus was ecstatic, running in the air between the trees with his senses pushed to their limits, the teenage Yukai was absorbing every sensation around him. It's been so long since he had seriously hunted something and now when he got his praise sent, adrenaline pumped through his veins. Without a sound, he closed to the running group, a black shade with a white streak among shadows. Faster morons, we have to gain as much distance before they realize. When we're far enough, everyone gets close to me and we'll teleport somewhere else to regroup. Through the forest, rung a sharp voice making Septimus grin at their idiocy. They didn't even try to mask their trails or scent and just ran in one direction in as a group. Not that they could hope to lose him but that just killed almost all the fun for him. With few more seconds of silent, sprinting, he was above them, the group of ten exorcists and a fallen angel. Just a little longer and it'll be safe to teleport. Move faster and, thud, before them dropped a grinning Septimus, making the group stop. Exorcists instinctively raised barriers between themselves and the interloper who stood there swaying his tails. Man, that was some good jog, running after you. But unfortunately someone's waiting for me, so I'll take you seriously." He said lightly while his fingers started moving in the air. The fallen angel leading the group walked to the front. Just like Azazel's data said, he had the appearance of a middle-aged man and wore a grey trench coat paired with a fedora. When he was next to he shield conjured by his subordinates, he grew four black wings and summoned a blue spear. So someone caught up to us. Honestly, I'm grateful, Mr. Devil. When I was ordered to retreat after being gifted with new powers without even being able to use them, I was pissed off. But now with you here, I can test my new strength and still obey my superiors. Men, don't interfere. I'll beat this enemy myself and prove that the name Donasik is to be feared. 
Let's. Sheesh. You sure like to talk. Septimus stopped him as he put his headphones on and hid his cat ears. Finishing scribbling a spell in the air, he hit the play button causing the red parts on the headphones to shine. Woo you 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 d you d you d u r e turret a a e. Loud waves of sound at a hazardous volume and frequency emitted from the place where the orange-eyed Nekomata was writing, bypassing the weak defensive spells. Seeing the exorcists dropping around him made him remember how Marana's sacred gear gave him the idea of such a powerful technique. It was ironic how such a shy and quiet person had the loudest and flashiest powers among them, but even his crude imitation was handy to disable mass of weakling without killing them. Ugh! What was that? Donaseek grunted dizzily with his ears leaking blood as he tried to stand. When he focused back on his cat-like enemy, he only caught him vanishing in a short burst of black smoke. In the next second, he felt a cold presence behind him and sharp pain coursing through his body. Feeling his limbs go stiff, Donaseek was snatched and thrown over the same devil's arm. And no one dare, disturb the Sue tilde tilde nd of silence. Septimus sang satisfied, as he flew towards the church with the fourth fallen angel immobilized. Issei, I've got the target. I'll break his control in a few moments, get ready to use your chance. Great, when you knock him out teleport here and evacuate Asia and Rainair. Answered Issei, sending him the information on their location. Got it, give her hell. Ending their connection, Septimus arrived before the church and saw his master's peerage finishing the last exorcists. Before his king was a small fallen angel with her hands bound behind and lacking most of her clothes, probably because of the famed power of destruction, but besides that was unscathed. Yo, everyone, I see that everything's perfect on your end. He commented with a smile as he landed. And it looks like you did great too. Rias pointed to the man in his arms. Yeah, Senpei, could you watch him for a moment? Septimus adjusted the older man in his arms and prepared to knock him out. All right, lights out in three, two, one. After sending a flare of energy to Donaseek's brain and stunning him, Septimus unceremoniously dropped the man and again disappeared in a cloud of smoke. DXD, got it, give her hell, behind you. As the older dragon roared into his head, Issei spun around and slashed his tail out at the flying spear. Two more to the left. Not even trying to block the light projectiles, the demi-dragon grew his wings back and with a strong beat. Flew over them. The situation was becoming more and more uncomfortable for the brown-haired Hyodo. While for now, he was unharmed and the only things that were damaged were his clothes, running around and dodging missiles was exhausting. Thank goodness for Diedrag and Albion constantly monitoring the situation and helping him. Both of the fallen angels were also losing their strength from summoning dozens of light spears, but not fearing counterattacks and ganging up on him made their job a lot easier. Just die you filthy dragon! yelled Calawarner throwing yet another spear. Not gonna happen again! Issei shot back, spinning in the air. Boom! The shining bolt flew harmlessly over Issei. However, when the spear hit the ceiling it exploded, causing debris to rain on him. Shit! Finally! Rainair! Finish him! Warner screeched, seeing her chance in Devil's confusion. With the same mechanical movements, the ordered fallen summoned two more spears and dashed. Alright! Lights out in three, two. One, as Septimus, voice rung in his head, Issei prepared to make his move. When the counting ended, Rainair dropped unconscious, literally a puppet whose strings were cut. Promotion. Night, shouting out those two words, Issei felt something inside of him morph, a new surge of energy coursing through him. Passing over the falling Rainair no pun intended he ran at an insane speed at Calawarner burying his fist in the blue net's abdomen with enough force to send her crashing into the wall next to the stairs. Right then, a moment before Rainair's body hit the floor, in a burst of shadows Septimus materialized, catching the unconscious girl. Oh hey oh, he greeted everyone, wah, Calawarner screamed in surprise and spewed out a large amount of blood. 
Just then did she realize, that she also lost hold of Asia, who was now safe in Issei's arms. Adjusting the one he held, Septimus teleported to his brother and took the other sleeping girl from him. Ya nay, and with that, the three of them were gone. With now only two of them left in the room, Warner knew how everything changed. She was all alone with an enraged dragon, who was after her head, without any support, leverage or hostage. Again her plans were ruined by this half-breed and this time it would end with her death. No, wait, not only him. That one that just showed up with black and white hair was the same who stopped her from ending the half-dragon for good. He was like a black guardian angel hovering over and stepping in whenever his ward was in danger quite ironic. Eyes, you wouldn't hurt me, would you? Please, forgive me, I'll do anything. Seeing no other option, she tried to plead for her life, no matter how small the chance it had. Wearing an innocent look and softening her voice, the fallen angel turned to Issei. Without anyone standing between him and the woman, who was the reason of his and his brother's deaths, who enslaved his childhood friend and tried to harm his new one, Issei could finally let loose. Her plead only heated up the fire that burned in him for almost weak and turned it into an inferno of rage. Now, show her why you should not mess with Dragon. Kill her in the most painful way, for she must pay for what she has done. As his grandfathers roared in agreement Issei, stared at Kalawarner with disgust. Really, anything, well, there's one thing that you could do for me. Kala Warner's face lit up, tell me, Kara Chan. He leaned in closer, would you die, for me, as he spoke his voice grew darker and more primal. The last two words resembled more an animalistic roar more than a human voice. Fires around him erupted with new strength, dancing around and over him, giving him a demonic look while his scales that reflected the light only enhanced this effect as Kala Warner stared into his normally warm brown eyes she instead saw reptilian ones of a beast overwhelmed with fear the blue-haired fallen angel stopped any form of thinking and is the only thing anyone would do facing something like that she turns around and flies up the stairs with everything she had praying for a miracle but there is none for when she was halfway through the tunnel burning claws grasped her wing not slowing down, the savage half-dragon ran up the stairs to the chapel with his victim, leaving a trail of fire behind them. At the stairs' end, he threw her through benches. This is for manipulating me. He screamed as he ran to her with a knight's speed and brought his fist to her stomach, making her spew more blood. This, for killing me. A strong kick followed after that, sending her under the roof. And this is for everything you've done to my family and friends. He aimed at Kalawarner in her flight's peak and opened his mouth. Whoosh! Out of them erupted a large jet of fire that quickly engulfed the beaten black-winged angel. As the roaring blazes shot up, burning through the roof and sending flames high into the sky, smoked remains of feathers rained down upon him, the only thing left from his now-deceased ex-girlfriend. Sparing a last glance at them, Issei reversed his transformation and headed out. You did well, you've managed to save your friends and get rid of that crow, just as expected of my descendant. Albion stated proudly, giving his grandson a mental pat on the back. He indeed did well, but not because of your blood, but mine. As if, tuning out arguing dragons, Issei opened the doors and came face to face with Septimus who had his headphones on and waved his hand like a conductor. You got you got the devil inside ya. You set the church on fire. Noticing his brother Septimus, took off his headphones and grinned. Beautiful performance. So, how are you now, feeling better? Back to your normal self? The Nekomata asked, pulling his dragon sibling in a one-armed hug. Feeling the tension leaving him, Issei let out a long sigh. I think so. There is no more Kalawarner, I got my revenge and helped Rainer in Asia. No one got hurt, but, Septimus stopped him quickly with a flick on the forehead. No butts now, except for a women's butts with your perversion. You did great, girls rescued, bitch roasted, everyone's happy.
Don't even try to sulk about what happened. You have your harem dream, we can't have you afraid of relationships with girls now. Quote dot dot dot, I prefer breasts over asses. After a moment of silence following Septimus, joke, Issei answered with his own and light smile. And that's the spirit, now go, there's someone who wants to talk with you. Or even few, someone's. The black-haired Hyodo approved, pushing his brother towards the group of the devils and turned back towards burning building. And that's what I think about you and your domination. That was low Albion, in that case, let me tell you something about your supremacy. Turning his focus back inside his mind, Issei heard both heavenly dragons still going on with their rant against each other. Albion, Diedrake, if not for you I don't think I'd be able to save them. So, thanks, both of you. Pure gratitude emanating from this simple sentence stopped both dragons in their tracks. Neither was sure how to react, so both of them just grumbled something more or less sounding like, you're welcome, and retreated back to their hosts. Eyes, you're alright, I'm so happy. Rias hugged his arm between her breasts smiling with relief. Era era, you've let out so much energy in this church that even here we've felt it. And those flames looked so impressive. Akino hugged his other arm. And it all gets, me all excited. She whispered seductively with a slight blush, nibbling lightly onto his ear. Akino, Rhea screamed, getting flustered herself. Blood slowly started drop from Issei's nose as his mind focused on the sensation of his arms being sandwiched by two beautiful girls who looked like they were about to fight over him. Boom. As an unexpected explosion rung through the air, the three of them turned around ready to defend themselves from some missed exorcist or a hiding fallen angel. What they saw instead was a figure of Septimus standing before the blown up church with his arms spread and large magic circle before him. What are you doing? They screamed at him. Huh, oh, well, this fire flare that Issei sent was most likely visible to the whole city. So, here I thought that it'd be easier to just fake it into a gas leak or something like that than mesmerize everyone. Both king and queen thought about it and after a moment nodded with a hint of respect at his forethought. Besides, I just wanted to blow something up. My opponent was seriously unsatisfying and I had to rush everything. And with that, all gained respect was gone. The problem is, that even if it was abandoned, this building still belonged to the church, and they for sure won't be happy with what you've done. Rias groaned lightly, thinking about all the paperwork that she'd have to fill because of that. We'll think about something, don't worry Bucho. But where are Kaneko-chan and Kiba? Nothing happened to them, they're alright, they just watch over prisoners. Let's go check on them. Dragging Issei away from Akino, the crimson-haired devil led her servants to where their comrades were. As the two black-haired devils were left behind, Akino leaned closer to Septimus. You were not so bad. She spoke lowly, sending shivers down his neck and causing his hair to stand. Leave me alone. Play with Issei. I'm not gonna be your toy. Septimus yelled and ran before them, leaving behind Akino who laughed at how easy both brothers were to tease. When the three of them arrived, they saw a group of exorcists and Mitelt chained in a circle, with Kiba and Kaneko standing over them and Septimus glaring at Akino from behind the petite rook. Great job, Issei-kun. The blonde knight spoke with a bright smile, while Kaneko only nodded her head in silent acknowledgement. A bit further, the now awake Asia was kneeling over the still unconscious Rainair, a green light radiating calmly from her hands. When she saw Issei, she ran to him and crushed him in a tight hug. Eyes San, thank you, thank you very much. Young Nun cried out happily. You don't need to thank me. That's what's friends are for. Issei answered with a smile as he patted her head. FF friends, yeah, I mean, we're friends now, right? After his answer, the blonde hugged him closer with tears of happiness falling freely from her eyes. Meanwhile, Septimus, shielding himself with Kaneko, walked closer to the crying girl and looked at her carefully. Issei, I think I know why I wanted to protect her from the minute I saw her. 
He walked around her. Visualize this. Change her hair into a braid. Give her a blue old-fashioned dress and armor over it and she'll look like Artoria. Saber. Color matches. Eyes too. Their build is similar and she even has an ahoge. Septimus got more and more into his speech, making its target hide behind Issei, with the rest of the devils looking at him weirdly. Cough otaku. Cough, Issei smirked with a fake cough and smug grin. Fuck you, I see that everything went well. A familiar voice caught everyone's attention and made them look at the sky. There, with an escort of ten fallen angels, was Azazel with his arms crossed. Azazel Sama. Azazel looked in direction of the chained group that called to him and turned to the fallen angels that were with him. Take them and Rainer back to headquarters, I'll decide on their punishments later. But leave the Donesik here, I'll interrogate him right now. With swift movements, his subordinates gathered around the exorcists and quickly vanished in a green magic circle. When they left, Azazel dropped his serious face and flew down to the remaining group. Phew, that was some nice fire flare and explosion. Let me guess, Issei and Sep. Then he spotted Asia, who was still clutching to Issei. You must Asia, nice to meet you, I'm Azazel. I'm terribly sorry for my underlings, I'll make sure to punish them accordingly. But that still won't solve her problem. She has nowhere to go, and I don't think she wants to stay in Grigori after what happened. Issei commented as he got out of the nun's hug. I could reincarnate her into my peerage, but I don't think that a member of the church would abandon the belief just like that. Rias offered them an option as she summoned her last unused rook. I don't want to betray the lord, but if that means I'd stay with Ai's San all. Asia started quietly as she extended her hand to the evil piece, with every devil around her holding their heads in slight pain at God's name. However, she was stopped when Septimus grabbed her hand and looked her in the eyes. Wait, Nun Saber, let's get this straight. You want to still follow big guy up high, but also want to have friends and be able to contact with Issei here. Why yes, she answered with a nod, getting an encouraging smile from Issei. Nothing easier. Rest of the group watched him curiously as he took out the phone and selected number putting it on speaker. Hello. Yo Dulio, how's my second most favorite blood and doing? Hey Sep, why you're calling, especially when in your country it's 1am? Well, there are two reasons. First, you're on speaker and Issei is next to me. Say, hi Dulio, hi Dulio, hey Issei, I hope you're doing good. Back in the supernatural, yeah, he is, and that leads to the second reason. He's met a young nun that was recently excommunicated but did nothing wrong and she only wants to have friends. Could you pull some strings and quietly get her back into the church, in a way that she'd befriend some people? I'll get you full course meal made by Elaine and mom together for that. Anything I'd want, and why thing, consider it done, someone will come to get her in a few days. Rias and her group listened with curiosity to the phone call. When Septimus walked away talking over some details, Asia raised her head looking curiously at the brunette, not understanding how that person could help her. Eyes San, how is the person your brother's talking to going to help me? You see, Dulio is known as, the strongest exorcist, in the church and I'm sure he'll be able to think of something. Issei said as if it was nothing much. Meanwhile, let's ask our Rouge here a few questions. Azazel spoke up as he pointed at what lay few meters away. Himahima-san, could you? Getting a nod of approval from Rias, Akino summoned small thunderbolt. A predatory smile spreading over her face indicated to everyone there what was going to happen, making everyone except Azazel and Kaneko take a step back. Bzzzzzzt. Arg. When the bolt hit him, Donesik woke up almost choking on his tongue. Before he could even comprehend where he was, a pair of small but surprisingly strong arms grabbed his head from behind and a somewhat familiar face with golden bangs appeared before him. Hello there. Donnie was it. You see, it's been a long day and we have some questions, so how about you quickly answer some of them for us? 
Azazel lowered himself over him. A Azazel Sama, the fallen angel, stuttered as an annoyed pair violet eyes bore into him. You recognize me, good. Let's make it short. Tell me who orchestrated all of this, so I can go and personally rip their wings off, and I'll just toss you in a comfy cell in the Grigori, instead of putting you through the same fate. The governor general let out a dangerous aura as he spoke in a dark voice, reminding everyone around that under his carefree attitude there was a veteran of the Great War, one leading a whole faction that held its own against the forces of God and the four great Satans. Bulging his eyes, the terrified man couldn't avoid looking at the awoken monster before him. Forcing his mouth to talk, Don Aesik immediately cracked. I'll talk, I'll talk. Just please, spare me. I was just a pawn, he promised me more power and occasion to use it. What or who? He. He's the one who directly gave all orders to me, Calawarner and that crazy exorcist. He's cough. Before Don Aesik could say something more, a green seal appeared on his chest and blood filled his mouth. Hum. A triggered suicide spell. Someone must be observing and didn't want us to hear what this one could spew around. As both the Grimori group and Asia stared and at dead fallen angel, Azazel examined the corpse and looked around. Suddenly, hearing a rustle from the bushes behind them they turned towards its source. Everything's done. Did I miss something? A certain black-haired Nekomata got out of the bushes, looking at the startled people before him. DXD. In a dark room, stood two men looking at a large screen showing the scene at the abandoned church. A small flame appeared in the taller one's hand as he lit up the cigarette and placed it in his mouth. We'll have to report that mission was a complete failure. We neither eliminated the half-breed nor acquired the nun's sacred gear. On top of that, we've lost two fallen angels and almost got exposed. What have I told you about smoking in here? Besides, remember that it was only, almost. We've silenced the talkative one, the exorcist got away and they were kind enough to kill the blue one without asking any questions. The shorter man snatched the other one's cigarette and trampled it, annoyance evident in his voice since it wasn't the first time his partner did something like that. And that's the only reason you two are still alive. Now get out of my sight and fly to tell your boss about your failure, little crows, before I pluck your feathers. A cold voice spoke from the darkness behind them, giving both fallens a visible shudder. As they hastily ran away from the room, a hooded figure neared the screen and trailed its hand over it. You've proven that you can be an annoyance. But is this all you are, or will you be able to entertain me? Know your sin. Septimus Hiodo. Race. Reincarnated devil, previously hybrid of Nekomata and unknown species. Sin designation. Wrath. Appearance. Black hair white bangs, orange eyes with cat-like pupils, average build, height 184 centimeters. In Nekomata form he have two tail, left black and right white and cat ears, right black and left white. Powers and abilities. Mastery over various kinds of magic, including Norse, Devil, Fallen Angel, Black, White, Fairy and Dragon to the point of being able of combining them and creating his own variations. Expert in Senjutsu and Yujutsu. Manipulation of space and time to limited degree. Highly skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, swordsmanship, use of scythe and staff. Access to personal pocket dimension, heightened sensed and basic strength skilled in stealth, great tactician. Likes. His family and friends, all sort of tricks, pranks, and mischief, experimenting with magic, theatrix, cosplay, anime, manga, games. Dislikes. Anyone messing with his family, cliche and poor. Settings. Being called an otaku, women into BDSM terrifies him. Short backstory. During his first years after meeting Issei and being adopted into Hyodo family, young Septimus was barely even talking to anyone outside of them in Azazel. Because the only things he remembered from his old life were shards mostly focused around his mother, he was obsessed with his past, for years searching about his father without any success. As time flew by he slowly opened up to other people and let go of his search of the past, 
with dyeing his bangs the same color as his birth mother hair as a memento of her. After Issei's accident, Septimus went on a journey around the world to learn new types of magic and let his brother have a somewhat easier time without him around. That's all for now until next time.